Thank you. The next item of business is topical questions, and we start with number one from Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that ScotRail has had to pay a record amount in financial penalties in the last nine months. Minister Hamza Youssef. The sole purpose of the service quality incentive regime known as Squire, uh, one of the toughest, if not the toughest, in the UK, is to drive up standards for passengers and deliver new and improved facilities by reinvesting any penalties imposed in qualitative improvements throughout the network. This approach ensures that the onus to improve substandard assets, facilities at stations, or indeed on trains, rest squarely on the shoulders of the franchisee, as penalties are deducted from the subsidy they receive and reinvested, as I say, in driving up quality through other customer-facing improvements. Uh, ScotRail's performance is uh, above the GB average, but as is already well documented, and that I think I said to the member uh, yesterday too, it is not as high as ministers demand, nor indeed passengers expect. I fully expect the forthcoming independent Donovan review to be the building block in which ScotRail makes a, a marked turnaround in the overall customer experience. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Scotland's rail passengers really do deserve better than the Transport Minister simply repeating his words that he expects improvements. He's increasingly, frankly, sounding like a, a railway station tannoy announcer repeating the same old message about delays, but in this case, it seems without the apology. The problem is no one's listening to the Transport Minister, least of all Abilio. It's nearly four years since this government awarded them the ScotRail franchise, promising to improve Scotland's railways, but these record fines reveal a rail service getting worse on this Transport Minister's watch, not better. Can the Transport Minister therefore tell us just when Scotland's hard-pressed rail passengers will have a railway system where the rail fares aren't rising above the rate of inflation and wages, where new trains aren't being delivered late, where passengers aren't standing on a platform wondering if their train will actually stop, and where 76%, yes, 76% of key performance benchmarks aren't being missed. Minister. I'll ignore the, the kind of personal uh, remarks that he made uh, in the beginning of uh, his question, and I'll go straight into some of the substance uh, if I can. And that is to say that despite his apocalyptic uh, version of events, they simply don't hold true. Yes, there must be improvement. I've always acknowledged that and driven that, and I'll come to some of the positive effects of that. But there, of course, has been under my watch, but indeed under this government's watch, uh, record levels of satisfaction at 90%. That made Jabelio technically the largest, the best performing largest operator in the entire United Kingdom. Record investment in railway, which has seen new railway that hasn't been opened in 50 years, like the Borders Railway, for example. We did, of course, throughout 2017, see improved performance. Admittedly, of course, though that dipped through the autumn and winter period. So clearly there are areas of improvement through the Squire regime, which is the most robust. We are seeing changes. So there has been improvements. If you looked at the Squire, at station shelters, train information screens, and for example, on train graffiti, but clearly in other measures, uh, there has to be improvement. And just to get to, the, again, the substance of the point here, that the Squire regime, because of the interventions of Transport Scotland, myself and others, the, 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 the result of that is that we're seeing far more uh, staff being recruited now by Abellio, which in turn should help to improve the overall customer experience. And I'd be happy to share with the member uh, some of those uh, staff recruitments in more detail, but we're seeing 20 stations positions being filled, 13 station dispatch, dispatch positions being filled by Abellio, 18 gateline staff, 38 catering posts, uh, 14 catering staff uh, and on the Dumfries route alone. So all of these things should hopefully help to see a better overall customer experience. And what I would say to the member to encourage him is that instead of sniping from the sidelines, if he came with some helpful suggestions, yep. I'd be more than happy to listen to them. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Well, let me just give the, the Transport Minister one helpful suggestion and tell him exactly where I stand on Scotland's railways and Britain's railways. The, the Transport Minister doesn't seem to accept that we have a problem and that the railway system, frankly, is broken. So when we stop praising and trying to prop up a privatised railway system that, frankly, has come to the end of the track, will he answer this straightforward question? Does he support not just preparing public sector bids for franchises, but bringing our railways back under public ownership so that people so that people and performance are the priority, not profits. Will they give a straight answer to that straight question? Minister. Here's a straight answer. It was Labour that denied this Scottish right. Government the powers to introduce a public sector bid. So I'll take no lectures off Colin Smith on a publicly owned railway. And what I'll also say to him, of course, is that he forgets that 54%, over half of the delays on the rail network, are by the nationalised part 
of the rail work by Network Rail, which is a reclassified body under the Department for Transport. What Colin Smith can't tell us is how much will it cost, of course, to bring it back into national hands. A who are putting tens of millions of pounds of their own investment. What budget will that come from? The health budget or the education budget? Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. On customer experience, is the Minister aware that despite the promise by ScotRail of five carriages to transport rugby supporters from the borders of Midlothian to the International on Sunday, the 11th of February, which I then publicised to constituents, a train breakdown meant that there were only two, so the train was packed from Tweed Bank and Gallus Shields and stop skipped, leaving folks standing at the platforms in Newton Grange and Gore Bridge. The promise from ScotRail for the Calcutta Cup match this Saturday is yet again five carriages. Given ScotRail's track record, can I ask if the Minister will take a particular interest in whether this promise from ScotRail is fulfilled or not? Minister. Well, I would say to the member in her constituency and her part of uh, the country that she has seen, of course, some great improvements uh, in uh, the ScotRail service. Of course, we want to go further with the new tra trains that allow us to cascade. Uh, across the network. I accept her point fully, of course, that uh, extra carriages are only helpful if those extra carriages, uh, of course, are running. So I'll, of course, uh, look into major events, uh, planning for future events, and, and, and pass that message on to Scotland. I'm sure they've heard it loud and clear here. Uh, but I know she also has a direct relationship uh, with the MD uh, of Scotland, and she can raise those issues uh, to herself. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we repeatedly hear in this chamber uh, from the Transport Minister that the status quo in terms of performance is unacceptable and that there must be improvements. But he will be aware that the moving annual average performance metric has not been met since August of last year. And we now find the Squire report shows that 14 out of 34 benchmarks were missed for an entire year. That's 14 out of 34. So can I ask the Minister what his view is on these disappointing trends? What assurances has Scott Rail given him regarding turning things around? But more importantly, when does he think that the current franchise holder will meet its contractual obligations in terms of punctuality and performance? Minister. Uh, well, I think, you know, it makes a fair point that, of course, performance is not at the level we expected. But I do take him back to my previous answer, that once we put in a performance improvement plan, when we face challenges, or ScotRail face challenges, uh, towards the tail end of 2016, we saw a number of periods uh, and months of improvement. We saw that, in fact, it took it to, to, to record levels. I think that was acknowledged at time. Uh, by his predecessor in the transport portfolio. So there has been improvement, but clearly autumn and winter resilience and planning on the railways by Scott Rail was not good enough, and they accept that themselves. Uh, in terms of when we expect to see that improvement, of course, I stress upon them that I intend to see, expect to see that uh, immediately. What will help with that uh, will be the Donovan Review. So Nick Donovan is somebody who has decades of experience within the railway. I had a, a preliminary conversation with him just to a couple of weeks ago, in fact, actually, it was just last week, and it was very, very positive to hear from him the areas that uh, he is looking and examining and exploring. Uh, I don't doubt that if those Donovan review recommendations are brought forward, uh, most of them, uh, no doubt, uh, will be mulled over by uh, the ScotRail board. Uh, if they are accepted, uh, then clearly uh, I expect them to make a difference. And I'll ensure that when the Donovan review is complete, uh, I'll say to ScotRail, of course, that there should be some transparency in what those review findings are, so that other members, uh, of course, uh, can uh, explore them uh, question them uh, as well. But in direct answer to this question, we expect to see their performance improving just as it did uh, in the first half of 2017. We expect that to be immediate. Mike Rumbles. Um, <clears throat> would the Minister agree that it is a good use of the Squire Fund to improve infrastructure at stations such as disabled access and provide a better service for all our rail travellers? And in that way, the performance of ScotRail for all its users could really improve. Minister. Well, yes, I, I do, and you know, Mike Rumbles has been particularly, uh, uh, he's been uh, forthcoming when it comes to inch station, I know, and the accessibility issues uh, around that, and he's been particularly involved in trying to find a solution uh, to that, and I, and, I, and I thank him for the work he's done thus far. Uh, in terms of uh, the Squire regime, the money is reinvested back into the railway for a better experience, not just for passengers, but also for staff uh, as well. For example, some of the Squire money has gone towards 250 body cameras and infrastructure for frontline staff to keep them safe uh, in a job which can often uh, be difficult at some parts uh, of the week uh, and the day. So, uh, yes, I, I do agree with him that accessibility uh, can certainly be part of that. He knows there's also the Minor Works Fund as well, which can help towards accessibility and obviously the UK government's access for all fund uh, as well. So all of these combined, uh, the more accessible our stations, uh, our transport is, then the better for everybody. John Mason. 
Hey, thank you. I mean, ScotRail obviously faced challenges with capacity on the Glasgow Edinburgh via Falkirk line, and they are suggesting that they're going to reduce the fares on the line via Airdrie and Bathgate, which is marginally slower. Hey, does he agree with me that that's quite an imaginative and positive step, and that perhaps that could be used in future so that uh, a, a lower fare would be offered on a slower route? Minister. Uh, yes, he's right to point out that uh, as things stand uh, this week and, and, and moving forward, uh, the Airdrie to Bathgate line, the lower level uh, Queen Street, will be uh, off the all, uh, all day. So therefore, £13, uh, so fa fairly, of course, significantly cheaper uh, than what it would be if it was uh, during the peak time. So yes, I mean, any lessons that can be learnt uh, from that, from encouraging or incentivising uh, passengers to move to other routes that are available, albeit they may be slower, uh, then I think that's a positive. But uh, he will be under no uh, illusion whatsoever that the priority, of course, is to get Hitachi to the manufacturer to deliver uh, the 385s and the schedule uh, that they promised. Now, that schedule hasn't been met, and we're continuing to push them to make sure that those carriages arrive so we can cascade across the network uh, and have those uh, additional carriages. But in the meantime, of course, any lessons that can be learnt from the reduced pricing, which is incentivising people to use other routes, then we should learn those lessons. Question number two, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assistance it is providing to Burnt Island Fabrication in light of reports that redundancy notices have been issued to staff. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government continues to support BIFAB, and that support is allowing work to continue on the contracts for the Beatrice Offshore Wind Farm. The loan facility extended by Scottish ministers will see BIFAB receive payments on commercial terms to alleviate immediate cash flow issues experienced by the company in connection with the Beatrice project. And myself and Paul Wheelhouse, the enterprise agencies and my officials are working regularly with BIFAB and all other interested parties to find a positive solution. I recognise though of course this remains a difficult period for BIFAB's workforce and their families. We don't underestimate the anxiety the lack of certainty of future orders and resulting employment has created. It's also a challenging period, of course, for BIFAB's contractors and creditors. However, we are continuing to do all that we can to help secure the long-term commercial future of the company, including potential inward investment. And I believe there are opportunities for the Scottish supply chain to be playing a leading role across a range of energy sector investments. And I believe that BIFAB can play a crucial role in this market going forward. David Jones. Can the Cabinet Secretary clarify what action the Scottish Government is taking to help find further investment for a yard to ensure that the highly skilled workforce and BIFAB remains at the forefront of wind farm construction and a key player in the UK rene renewable sector? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I've mentioned in my first response the work that's been done by ministers, uh, officials and the enterprise agencies. And collectively, we are doing all that we can within the scope of the powers that we have to support the management and the workforce at Bifab, of course, a private company. Uh, and that's in order to try and secure the long-term commercial future of fabrication at all three yards where Bifab are present. It is, uh, without question, a challenging time for the company, but we continue to provide support also in the form of the Scottish Manufacturing Advice Service, SMAS, speaking with both the offshore renewable and oil and gas sectors regularly about potential tender opportunities and, of course, crucially, liaising with potential inward investors. David Thomas. In the event of redundancies at the three BIFAB sites in Burntellin, Methil and Arnish, what support can the Scottish Government offer to these employees affected? Well, I would hope it would be obvious from my previous answers that we want to try, along with the agencies uh, and others, to avoid uh, any uh, redundancies. And we are working with BIFAB senior management, Scottish Enterprise and trade union representatives to do everything we can to avoid that situation. However, it is also true that we stand ready to provide support through our partnership action for continuing employment pace by providing skills development and employability support. And in that way, PACE aims to minimise the time individuals who may be affected by redundancy are actually out of work. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In December, as the First Minister told this chamber that the SNP government had saved by FAB and kept the workers in a job. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain to us why this chamber now today that 260 jobs are under threat, which equates to 20% of the workforce? And were we aware of this in December when the First Minister made this claim? Cabinet Secretary. It's, it's an unbelievable question from the member. He obviously was not listening to the First Minister when she made that statement. It was made clear at the point and has been made clear ever since. So what we were able to do uh, in November was to safeguard the contract, to see through the contract. Had we not done that, three times in that week, BIFAB would have gone to the wall and nobody would be working at BIFAB. Yeah, yeah. That's what the Scottish Government did then. That's the commitment we've shown ever since. That underpins the work that we are currently doing. And you would have thought 
even from a Tory, there might be some grudging respect and admiration for the work undertaken by the First Minister. Roger Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that all the workforce at Arnish have already been paid off, with only two retained for care and maintenance. He'll also be aware that the specialist equipment at Arnish is publicly owned. Can he make sure that BIFAB are carrying out their obligations to protect that equipment and that there is adequate staffing cover in the yard to do that? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think it's a very fair point raised and uh, of course I will ensure that that's the case although we have had discussions uh, with the management of BIFAB and also with the trade unions who are very active in Arnish uh, on that issue. I would say the reduction in staff was something that would have happened regardless of the package that was put in place in November as the contract itself uh, was wound down. But what we're trying to do is to make sure that Arnish can remain, as I say, a place of employment uh, and also to see how we can perhaps get more money in to improve the infrastructure even further. But the member makes the point about the public investment that's been made there already. We want to capitalise on that and I'll take forward the point that she's made that it should be protected. The equipment that's there should be protected in the meantime. Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Can I ask what upskilling programmes uh, are available to keep workers on the payroll and to keep the gates open over the next uh, difficult few months? And also, what the implications would be for BIFAB uh, if the inward investment the Cabinet Secretary mentions can't be secured? Mr. Secretary. I think, again, it's a very good point. I, I would just want to say, first of all, that that is where our efforts are going. First of all, in trying to get that our investment that Mark Ruskell talks about, that's absolutely crucial. Also, to see if we can try and get some of the contract opportunities which are available, uh, one by BIFAB, of course, within the, the rules with which we're bound. Uh, but also, in the event that that wasn't the case, and we're trying to avoid that, then uh, Mark Ruskell's quite right to say we should be examining, as we are, what opportunities there are for skills and further training of the workforce that's there, what other work might be able to be, to be done at the yard itself in terms of improving the infrastructure. So the member can be reassured that we are examining that and looking at what the options would be, although just to underline the point that we try to, we're trying everything that we can to avoid that situation coming about in the first place. And Willie Rennie. Uh, th this is a dark time uh, for the workforce. Uh, what I want to ask the Minister is, what is the long-term strategy to make sure that companies like BIFAB thrive on the back of the opportunities of the renewable energy sector, particularly the offshore renewables that are coming down the track? They should be thriving, not just surviving. So what is the long-term strategy from the government? Well, I think it's worth pointing out to Willie Rennie that BIFAB is a private company that enters into these contracts and what we've tried to do is try and help them to make sure, not least because of its employees, that they can continue to do that. But there is a thriving uh, sector in Scotland. In 2015 it supported 58,500 jobs in Scotland. That's around 14% of the total UK employment. It generated £10.5 billion in turnover, again 14% of the total UK turnover in this sector. But it is the case, I think this is the underlying point behind Willie Rennie's question. We want to try and make sure more of this work, and there's substantial work both in Scottish waters and throughout the UK and indeed Western Europe, that we want to see more work coming to Scotland. So what we'll continue to do is provide support to the sector as a sector, but in the case of a particular company like BIFAB, through the different measures which I've mentioned already in terms of trying to get new investment and new contracts, we'll provide support to individual companies as well. Thank you. Apologies to Dean Lockhart and Claire Baker. I'm afraid there's not enough time to take any more questions today. We'll move, that concludes topical questions, and we'll move on to our next item of business, which is a debate on motion 10397 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Scottish Rate Resolution. Could I invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now?